First of all, before we read the scriptural lessons this morning, I want to thank Becky. Uh, I recognized early on when I was at Trenum Road United Methodist Church that she had a lot of talent. And one of the talents she had that I was so envious of, she could sing. I couldn't sing a lick. So people used to wonder, how could you be called to be a preacher if you can't sing at all? And so I told Paula Wilson, who was my choir director there at Nicholas, I told Paula one day, I said, Paula, I want you to understand that great anthems like we have here and like we had at Trenton Road, great anthems make up for a lot of weak sermons. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here, and Becky was a very effective uh, associate pastor kept me straight. She was a good preacher. She still is a good preacher. But I want to read some lessons for you this morning, two lessons. One is from the prophet Isaiah, and the other is from the Gospel of Luke. If I could get all this straightened up up here. First of all, a reading from the prophet Isaiah. If I can find it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, and because it is the Gospel lesson, if you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught so many fish that the nets were beginning to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. And when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. You may be seated. Thank you.
In the year that I was appointed to Nichols United Methodist Church in the metropolitan city of Nichols, <laughs> population 300, the bishop thought I was so good he gave me two churches. Nichols United Methodist Church, which was the downtown church, and then the Little Floyd's Church, which was out on the highway. So I said, I didn't realize I was so good. But anyway, the Nichols Church was right across the street from the parsonage, so I could walk across the street to go to the office every morning if I wanted. He said, Dad, I want to go with you. So I said, OK, come on. I took him by the hand. And as we are walking across the street, Joel points to the church as if he sees it for the first time. He points to the church and he says, Dad, is that God's house? Well, I was impressed that my four-year-old was asking such deep theological questions. I said, yes, son, that's God's house. And then Joel said, Dad, how come I never see him there? <laughs> and his astute theological father said to him, Son, I think I hear your mother calling you. <laughs> A priest stood in the temple in the holy city of Jerusalem and saw something. And because he saw something, he was felt compelled to say something. Now, we hear those words a lot these days, see something, say something. Sometimes we see something and we feel compelled to say something also. Sometimes we don't see anything at all, but we say something anyway. Mark Twain was nothing like Isaiah. Nevertheless, Twain saw something and he said something too. And, what, and Twain saw his own preacher regularly. And so Twain said of his own preacher, something about his preaching. He said he had nothing to say, and he said it very well. <laughs> the claim of Isaiah was that he saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And what Isaiah saw was so significant, had such an impact on him, that he dated his vision in the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died. He died of leprosy, the king did. And when he died, he left Judah under the dominance of Assyria, which created a mess and fear for those people. King Uzziah died in the year 700, 742 BCE, 742 years before the birth of Christ. Do you know how long ago that was? That was 2,700 years ago. And I don't know about you, but I find it amazing, actually astonishing, that 2,700 years ago, a man stood in the temple and saw something and was compelled to say something that is still relevant for us today. Down through the corridors of history, his voice thunders to us. So it's rather astonishing that these ancient words have meaning for us. You know, Isaiah is older than Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, which led somebody to say that the wisdom of the Hebrew, Hebrew prophets is greater than the wisdom of the Greeks like Plato and Aristotle. Isaiah is, is older than those, and his words are located in the good book, the good book. We know what book that is, don't we? Which calls, I think, for serious Bible study so that we can dig into those ancient words and mind the wisdom that's there. It calls for serious Bible study. After all, our ancestor in the Methodist faith, the Reverend Mr. John Wesley, said of himself, I am a man of one book. And he didn't mean the book of discipline. He meant the scriptures. And we, his offspring, we, his theological offspring, are the people of one book. So here I stand today, and there you sit, both of us together, in this Methodist temple. 
I see you and you see me and I know you are wondering what's he going to say. And since I am the preacher today, I must say something or else we will get out very early. Somebody said amen to that, I think. <laughs> In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, said Isaiah, and everything changed for him. What have we seen? What do we see that we think it compels us to say something, whether it's positive or negative? What have you seen? It compels you to say something in response. Or is what we see today so terrible that it leaves us speechless? It was in the year 2021 when we saw 800,000 Americans die of COVID. And some of us said a prayer of humility to get a vaccine and wear a mask so that others might live. It was in the year 2020 that we saw the big lie roll across the land like COVID. And we said with Flannery O'Connor, who paraphrased and quoted Jesus when she said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you odd. Have we come to that point in our history and our life together as people that to say something that's true is odd? So maybe the preacher this morning should speak on a softer note. And nothing is softer than to talk about children. But I want to talk about the children of the Charlie Brown gang who reflect so much of our human grown-up nature, who reflect so much of what we see and what we say in front of them. You remember what Lucy saw in Linus, don't you? And what she said to Linus? Linus's heart's desire is to be a doctor. And Lucy just rips that dream apart. She says, you could never be a doctor, Linus. You know why? Because you don't love mankind, that's why. <clears throat> Poor Linus. He's trying to find a way to defend himself. And all he can say is, Lucy, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> In the year of the deep loss of bipartisanship and community, we see people. We see all kinds of people, white, black and brown, yellow, rich, poor, conservative, liberal, straight, gay, bisexual, transgender. We see them all. We see the sick, the dying, the hungry. We see the anti-vaxxers. We see them. And sometimes we say what we think of them. We see Jew and Protestant and Catholic, agnostic, Muslims, atheists, and what do we say of them? My wife Trisha and I grew up in the small county seat town of Marion, South Carolina. Marion is famous for two things. One, it was named for the Revolutionary War soldier Francis Marion. And secondly, it's famous because when people ask, where is Mary, the answer is always, it's on the way to the beach. <laughs> we went to the First United Methodist Church there on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. We went to MYF, and on Sunday night, we went to church again on Sunday night. Should I say that one more time? We went to church on Sunday night in the little chapel there. And we sat with our girlfriends and boyfriends so that when they sang Love Lifted Me, we elbowed each other. <laughs> but it was in that place and in that time that I cut my religious eye teeth on a poem by Edgar Guest. When he wrote, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And I thought, oh my goodness, maybe I better find another profession. Nobody wants to hear a sermon rather see one, emphasizing that it's what you do that counts. And what we do counts. That's true. But a few years later, along came another preacher by the name of Fred Craddock. And Craddock said, 
It's what you say that counts as much as what you do. What did Isaiah say? Isaiah said the most terrible words a preacher can say. Standing before any congregation, Isaiah said, Woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And you have to ask the question, what did he mean by unclean lips? Well, I take it to be a metaphor for human speech. And out of human speech comes all kinds of things, either positive or negative. But sometimes what these days seems to be coming out of our speech is lies and deceit and sin, things like that, that don't help anybody. Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne, high and lifted up, and he said his confession for himself and for his people. And his confession was enough for his lips to be redeemed. So one of the seraphs took a burning coal from the altar and came to Isaiah and touched his lips with it and purified his speech. We have had unclean lips, haven't we? Remember your childhood days? I remember mine when I said things that my parents said were bad words. Bad, bad words. Naughty words. But I was spared. They did not touch my lips with a burning coal. Instead, they threatened to wash my mouth out with soap. You remember those days? I see some of you nodding, yeah. Mostly this text from Isaiah today is interpreted as Isaiah's calling, and it is. He found his calling in the year that King Uzziah died. The question is, what was his calling? The Sunday school class that I attempt to teach from time to time knows that I am fond of quoting the poet Walt Whitman. One of his poems that I like very much is entitled, O oh Me, O oh Life. How many times have we said those words to ourselves? You wake up on a Monday morning, it's dark and dreary and cold and wintry, and snow is still on the ground, and you know that now that you're awake, you've got a pile of work waiting on the desk in your office, and you say, oh me, oh life. Yes, we say those kinds of things. So in that poem, Whitman responds to the recurring questions that life brings to us. He had, his question, he had his list of questions, I have mine, and the recurring questions of life that faces all of us are questions like, who am I? Am I this or am I that? Am I one or am I another? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? What do I believe? Is there something inside of me that's false? Is there something in my life that I'm trying to avoid? Whitman, in his poem, said that life was like a play on the stage, like a drama. And the drama or the play on the stage never comes to an end, even when we come to our end. And so Whitman says, and the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. The powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. God gave Isaiah a part to play. God called Isaiah to contribute his verse in the year that King Uzziah died. The opening hymn this morning reminds us of it. All ye who are of tender heart, Take your part. And the powerful play goes on. And you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? What will your part be? And the powerful play goes on. That is our calling that we have a part to play in this drama of mortal life. 
We have a calling to answer for all that we see and all that we say, to answer for that. Our part is to say the truth. Not just any truth, but the truth of the great truth sayer himself way over there in the Gospel of John when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And we struggle with those words. And one of the reasons we struggle with those words is because it makes it sound like Christianity is the superior religion of all the religions in the world and all the others don't count. So we don't know what to say about those words. So let's take a shot at it this morning and say something about it. When Jesus says, I am the way, Maybe he means to say, my way embraces all ways. And when he says, I am the truth, maybe he means to say, my truth embraces all truth. And when he says, I am the life, maybe he means to say, my life embraces all life. That is our calling. And when we struggle, Father comes to us. We just got through celebrating Christmas. That's right at the heart of Christmas. God coming to us in a baby rocking in a manger. Heaven come to earth for us, you see. That is our calling to play our part in this drama of this mortal life. It's the same truth teller in Luke's gospel this morning where Jesus sees two boats and he sees some fishermen mending their nets. And he says to those fishermen, you will catch more than fish. You will catch people. You will even catch all those people that Linus can't stand. To play our part, to contribute our verse, to say what we have seen, that takes courage and strength and love and faith and hope. And where does that come from? Where do we get that scourge, that courage and that strength? Do you know? Well, I will tell you. A priest stood in the cathedral and he lifted up high the tiny wafer. And he said something that sounded like hocus corpus body of Christ, body of Christ, body of Christ. That's where all of that courage and strength comes from. I see you today. We need it now as never before. This little tiny piece of bread and this little cup, we need it as never before. See something? Say something. Walk in the way. Abide by the truth. Live the life. We do not come to the Father so much as the Father comes to us, heaven to earth, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.